Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you back to today's live session of the Hindu newspaper analysis. A place where we discuss the most important and relevant news stories from the Hindu newspaper, both from the prelims and from the mains examination point of view. I hope all of you are doing good. I hope your preparation is going right on track, especially <clears throat> if there are those who are planning to appear for the upcoming mains examination, I hope you are undertaking answer writing practices very, very seriously and you are making notes of all the important and relevant topics. Let's see what are the important topics that we have brought here for you. Today, we'll be discussing a couple of articles from the editorial section. The first article that we have here is about the railway safety. As you know, ever since the unfortunate rail accident in Odisha, we have seen a lot of articles written mainly from the point of view of rail safety. This article also touches on the same problem. This article says that in order to improve the rail safety in India, which has already improved quite considerably in the past couple of decades, we should give more freedom to the lower staff that is mainly responsible for upkeeping of the railway tracks. Second, we will be discussing about how US and Iran are secretly negotiating a new nuclear deal. As you know, the nuclear deal between Iran and P5 plus 1 called the JCPOA, it was turned or it did turn out to be a failure ever since Donald Trump, when he became the US president, walked out of the deal. Now that Joe Biden is the new president of the US, they have been discussing how to revive the US-Iran nuclear deal and the deal may be finalized very, very soon. Then from the prelims exam point of view, we will be discussing about how is it that warming oceans, especially on the side of the Arabian Sea, have made it harder for the IMD to forecast the cyclones. The reason why this article is written is, if you actually see the Bipojoy cyclone that made a landfall, the path of the cyclone that was first predicted by the IMD is not the path that it eventually took. So why is it that the IMD is not able to predict the exact path? That is why the article has been written. Then we'll be discussing how the famous Nehru library in Delhi will now be renamed. And in the end, the prime minister has collaborated with a musician to release a new song. Why? To promote the use of millets. So we'll be discussing what that is exactly. Now let's begin with the very first article. <clears throat> the first article that we have here, as the topic suggests, is based on a railway safety. Let me first discuss the theme of this article. The author here says that ever since the Odisha railway accident took place, we have seen a lot of different news stories come out. A lot of odd things have happened, a lot of very positive things have happened. Let's first talk about the positive things. Positive thing number one, we see a very quick response from the railway minister. The railway minister not just reached the place, he camped at the site for multiple days to oversee the rescue and relief operations. So the railway minister camping there, showing the alacrity, that is one good thing. Second positive thing to have come out is, we have seen that although this was a very, very, very bad, unfortunate accident, but if you actually see in the past two decades, the number of accidents in India, that is the railway accidents, have come down considerably. Now, what is the problem here? The problem is these kind of things like railway safety, etc. only come in the news when something wrong happens. When everything is going right on track, you will never see in the news. For example, would you see something in the news like in the past six months, no railway accident has happened. You will not see those kind of news stories. You will only see news stories when something wrong happens. So what we should not ignore as per the author is that in the past two decades, the number of accidents have come down considerably. The author says there are multiple departments that look after the railways because railways has its coverage across the entire country. People at the lowest level are responsible for inspecting the tracks. So people at the lowest level, linemen, what they do is they make sure that they see physically how the tracks are, if there's some problem in the track, if the track is misplaced or do we have to make some changes in the track. A part of the problem is a lot of times, let's say there is a person, a lower level official in the railways. He is conducting an inspection of the track and the officer sees that there is something wrong in the track. 
even then what happens is the lower level officer might not make this official communication to the seniors why because the seniors might not take him very seriously meaning that the people at the lower level who are actually responsible for physically inspecting the track their voices are not heard many times they are too scared to go up and complain and tell the authorities that see something wrong that has happened on the track or even if they do complain a lot of times we see that no action is taken this is why a part of the problem is as per the author the lowest level workers the lowest level officials in the railways are not given enough chances to speak up their mind if they see that something wrong has happened for example on the railway track they should be allowed to raise their voice without thinking of any negative consequences because the lower level officials know that there will be negative consequences they might be thrown out of their job this is the reason why most of them do not really raise any voice as i was telling you the number of derailments for example in india have reduced considerably just couple of years back it used to be about 350 per year almost one train derailment every single day even today do you know derailment is not very uncommon for example good train they derail all the time just that when the good train etc etc derail we do not have such a huge collapse as we saw in odisha so don't think that the odisha derailment is the first one of this year there are derailments that do happen very very frequently especially for the good train etc the trains coming out of the tracks but we don't have this humongous loss of life now the derailments or the number of derailment news have come out considerably for example it was only 22 in 2021 22 so it has improved considerably at the same time we have increased the railway traffic passenger at the same time we have also increased the freight loading means the goods that are transferred from one place to the other place all of that has happened and at the same time we see a situation where the number of accidents have also come down so both of these things have to be considered we should not just close our eyes and start criticizing the railways for no fault of theirs yes there was a big accident it has to be and it should be investigated properly but at the same time there are positives that we should not really ignore as per the author the reason why railway safety and the flow of information is so tricky as i said railways is a huge department they have thousands of employees working we have thousands of kilometers of railway track to physically inspect the entire railway track it is a responsibility of a lot of officials the problem is it is a lower level officials that are responsible for inspection <clears throat> and even then if they see something wrong it is very rare that they would actually complain because a lot of times i'll give you a simple example let's look at it in some other way have you noticed why people say it is so hard in india to get your fir registered have you notice as have you heard this many people would tell you that if you go to police station they will not register your fir it is very difficult to get your fir registered you know why that is you know why that is let's take a simple example let's say you go and register an fir the problem is every police station is ranked or is seen whether is it good or not based on how many firs they have pending for example if the police station registers your fir then they become responsible now to look into investigate that fir unless they investigate the fir and close it down it will be a pending fir on their name so tomorrow for example let's say the state police chief let's say if they are taking into consideration what are the different police stations which police station is good which is bad they will think the police station which has the most pending firs is the worst police station so what do the police officers do they try not to register the fir at all so that it doesn't come on their record exactly the same is something happening here yes the lower level officials do see that yes there is something wrong in the track either they don't go and put this in the minds of their official senior officials because they think the senior officials will blame them only the lower level officials or maybe in the past no action was taken this is where the problem starts and this is not just an india problem it's a problem across the entire and the entire world 
we have many other countries facing the same problem where lower level officials find something wrong, find a certain corruption case, find something wrong happening in their department, but they just do not go and complain to the higher officials. This is what needs to change. Now, how can it change? There is an example that the author gives of what happens in Britain. So in Britain, they have a system called CIRAS, C-I-R-A-S. Please listen to this carefully. C-I-R-A-S stands for Confidential Incident Reporting and Analysis System. This is a system followed in Britain. Now, what is this system? As the name suggests, if a lower level official find something wrong in the working of the railways or the department they can file a complaint and their identity will be kept confidential the seniors will not know who from the lower level of the staff complained against them or complained about what is the problem going on in the railway network it is quite similar to the whistleblower protection act i hope you all have read about the whistleblower protection act of 2014 that act is very similar when you for example complained to the CVC or identity is kept a secret, although there are certain exceptions, but that is how it works. Similarly, here also in UK, this system has been going on since mid 1990s. The objective is to encourage the lower staff to point out what are the deviations, what are the different types of problems that we have in the working of the system so that they can actually report and be free of any fear. A similar kind of a system can come to India as well. In India also we can have a similar kind of a system where the lower level staff is actually given enough confidence to go ahead and complain. But you also know the problem in these kind of cases is doesn't matter what kind of a new system you introduce, doesn't matter what kind of a new objective that you bring in. The problem here is unless the people at the ground level want to implement the new law or new system properly, you will not see much of a change. So in order to bring a real change, in order to make the railways, for example, even more efficient, even more safe, it's not about bringing new laws, it's about change in mindset, it's about people at the higher order, the hierarchy of the railways, they realizing the fact that anyone bringing complaints to them is bringing in their own interest. There is one more suggestion that the author has given here. The author here says that railways is a specialized ministry. It is a humongous ministry with a humongous workload, meaning that we should have a full time cabinet minister, especially for the railways. Why is the suggestion given? Do we not have a full time minister for railways right now? What do you think? Does the present government not have a full time minister for railways? What do you think? Okay, don't Google. Yes, we do not have a full time railway minister. Why is it so? Because the uh, railway minister, Mr. Ashwini Vaishnav, is not just the railway minister. He is handling multiple portfolios. He is also the IT minister. There are multiple portfolios that he is handling and not just the railway ministry. So this is where the suggestion has come in that we should have a person that is specifically for railway ministry and not other ministry because it requires a full time attention of the minister. Minister should not look into other things. Now, this is not to say that if the railway minister would have not handled other ministries, this accident would not have happened. Let's not make that assumption that the accident happened because the minister was involved in other ministry. That is not true. But yes, this is a suggestion that we need to have much, much more attention of the railway minister in ensuring that these reforms in the railways are carried out at the fastest possible speed. Then the author also says that there is a requirement for having better investment in the organization and in the physical infrastructure of the railways as well. Now, a couple of other data points which I wanted to share with you. First data point, as you can see here, the number of accidents of different types, derailments, collisions, unmanned level crossing, all of these have reduced considerably. This is a data till 2019-20 that I got from Guardian. As you can see, number of railway accidents are reducing, but even then, even then, if you compare this with some of the developed nations around the world, nations which run extremely fast trains, much faster than India, even if you compare this number with other countries, our number is still extremely high. 
So even when we have only 22 incidents of derailments, for example, in a year, that again is higher as compared to what we see in the other countries. That also is a fact that we should not ignore. Also, I wanted to share with you one more thing. You would have seen how when the railway accident occurred in Odisha, you saw very quickly the government of India calling for a CBI inquiry, right? There were many questions asked, why is the CBI inquiring this matter? Because the reason is, for railways, they have their own commission for railway safety. So there is a commission for railway safety that actually works just to look into all these accidents and all these incidents to ensure railway safety. I'll tell you the most important part. The most important, the most interesting part of this is this commission does not work under the Ministry of Railways. You know that this commission does not work under the Ministry of Railways. What does it work under? It actually works under Ministry of Civil Aviation. This is an important fact. Please do remember this commission of railway safety does not work under railway ministry. It works under Ministry of Civil Aviation. Now, why is that the case? Isn't it odd? The reason is that if it would have worked under railway ministry, then railway minister would have been able to influence it. When they undertake an inquiry, they have to decide who is guilty, who is not guilty. So maybe people in the railway ministry would have put pressure on them so that they actually don't blame the people responsible. So in order to make them independent, at least on paper, they work under control of the Ministry of Civil Aviation rather than Ministry of Railway. So do remember this as a fact. <clears throat> this is an old body. It has been existing since the time of the British. At the British time, it was called the Railway Inspectorate. The name was changed in 1961. In 1961, it was renamed as the Commissioner for Railway Safety. The Commissioner for Railway Safety usually undertakes inspection after all these kind of unfortunate incidents. CBI inquiry has been called because there's an assumption, there may be a criminal conspiracy behind it. So if it does happen, we have to see whether or not there is something for the CBI to take up. This was our first article for the day. Before I go on to the second one about US Iran nuclear deal, let me quickly take up there any comments. Kiraya is saying only Ashwini Vaishnav is handling multiple portfolios or earlier real minister also did the same. Can I usually real ministers don't handle multiple portfolios usually, but it's there is no rule like that. Usually railway ministers handle only railways. What used to happen was it's an interesting concept because if you go back to a few governments, for example, when we used to have coalition governments, railway ministry usually used to go to the supporting parties which supported the main government. Now that we have a full majority government, railway ministry is within the BJP. They have given multiple portfolios. So it's rare, but it's not against the law. Then Abhishek, Singh, Abhishek is saying, is it justifiable to say government should look into safety before going for bullet trains? See, both the things can happen simultaneously. It's not that you can focus only on bullet trains and not on, let's say, uh, safety. Both the things have to happen together. So it's not to say that safety is being ignored just because we are going on to bullet trains. I have a question, whistleblower. Whistleblower is a person who brings out any news of corruption or who brings out any internal information to tell about what corruption is happening. For example, if you know that in a government office, someone is taking a bribe openly, you break that news to the police, you will become the whistleblower. That is how it works. Ranjit, portfolio means what responsibility you have been given. Like Mr. Amit Shah, what is his portfolio? He is a home minister. Mr. Adnath Singh, what is his portfolio? He is a defense minister. Ms. Uh, Nirmala Sitravan, what is her portfolio? She is the finance minister. So that is what portfolio means. Mangal DBS, see, there is, there is no limit on how many ministries can one person handle. One person can handle 10, 15, 20 ministries also. There is no limit on that. However, the suggestion here is because these ministries require a lot of time and attention, it is better that one person handles one ministry, especially for a big industry, for a big ministry such as the railways. 
then okay, I'll take one or two more questions. Govardhan is saying, can I use commission of railway safety in conflict of interest question? Yes, you can. It is a fact. Uh, Dharmendra, I would request you not to spam and I will, will have to block you from chat if you just keep on pasting the same comment time and time again. Okay. Perfect. Okay, I'll take one or two more. Um, <clears throat> Shubham, uh, please don't copy paste the same comment time and time again. We have seen this. Also, one more thing, those who are asking for a summary, this session is on YouTube. It will remain on YouTube. Play the video on 2x. That will be the summarized version. So let the video end. Play it on 2x. That will be your summary. Rather than me repeating that. Okay, I'll take one last question. Uh, Shiva Kumar is saying, why is there a railway state minister? So basically, there are different types of ministers. There are cabinet ministers who handle the entire ministry. To assist the cabinet ministers, there are some ministers of state. Like in home ministry, you can have different ministers of state. Ministers of state are just like assistant to the cabinet minister to help them in managing the entire ministry. Perfect. Let's move on then. The second article that we have here is about the US-Iran nuclear deal. I hope all of you know that Iran had signed a nuclear deal with P5 plus 1 countries. P5 were the permanent members of UNSC and what was this one? One was Germany. So these six countries had signed a nuclear deal with Iran. What was the objective of this? The objective was Iran will not make a nuclear bomb. They will open their nuclear facilities for inspection by the IAEA. In return, these foreign countries, mainly America, would not freeze Iranian assets. They would allow the flow of money into Iran. That was the entire objective. However, when Donald Trump came to power, when Donald Trump became the American president, he said, no, it is a bad deal. I am going out of this deal. So America withdrew from this deal when Donald Trump was the American president. The problem is with America, this deal would not really have a lot of logic. Why? Because it is America that has most of the sanctions on Iran. If America doesn't actually go or doesn't involve itself in the deal, Iran would not really be interested. That is why ever since Joe Biden became the president, what happened was America again started negotiating with Iran about the deal. Now, please understand, both America and Iran want this deal to work. Please understand this very carefully. Let me try and explain this to you why and what are different factors of this deal. So, America and Iran, both of these would want the deal to work. Why? Let's first talk about Iran. Why would Iran want the deal to work? Iran would want a deal to work because a lot of their money is in the Western countries. America, NATO countries, their friends. What America has done, they have frozen these dollars that Iran owns. Billions and billions of dollars of Iran are frozen in foreign countries account. They are not getting them back. So Iran doesn't have enough money. Their standard of living of the general population is declining. So they would want to unfreeze whatever money they have so that they can work on their development. Look at it from the American point of view. Why America would want the deal to work? Iran is one of the largest producers of oil in the world. Because of American sanctions, Iran is not able to sell its oil to most of the countries. Iran only sells its oil mainly to China because they don't really care about what the US has to say. But Iran is not able to sell their oil to other countries. Now what happens now? Because Iran is not able to sell the oil, supply of oil is lower. So the price of oil is increasing. America would not want that. When the price of oil increases, Russia also gains out of it. America does not want Russia to gain out of it. So they would also want that Iran oil eventually comes in the market without the sanctions. For America, it would also have one more implication. Because America has imposed so many sanctions on Iran, Iran, China have become very close. America does not want that. America does not want Iran and China to come so close. Why? Because China is a country that has the potential to be almost equal to US in the coming years. They don't want Iran to have friendship. The problem that US has is 
many American friends don't want this deal. For example, Israel doesn't want this deal. Israel doesn't trust Iran. Israel says that if we give back the money that Iran has, they will for sure build a nuclear bomb. Israel was not in favor of the earlier deal also. They said we can't trust Iran. There was a problem with Saudi Arabia also earlier. Earlier, the Saudi Arabian government also did not want this deal. But now, as you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia are negotiating their own peace deal with the help of China. So now Saudi Arabia doesn't have so much of a problem. But all these things have to be taken into consideration. This is where the problem now starts. Now, if you actually see, as I said, right now, Iran, US talks are going on. Who is negotiating? Who is mediating in between? The mediation is being done by the ruler of Oman. So ruler of Oman earlier also in 2015 mediated the deal, passed on message from one person to the other. Oman ruler again has been seen in a very key position as the person who is mediating between the two. It is said that this deal might be finalized very, very soon. However, the interesting part is this time around, it will be an unwritten deal. Please remember this. The deal that they are talking about this time around will be unwritten deal. Why unwritten? See, when you have a written deal, that becomes a problem because when you have a written deal, American parliament also has to pass it. Only then it will be applicable. The American president knows if we have a written agreement, then we will have to give it to our parliament to ratify. Only then it will actually come into picture. So it is an unwritten deal. The deal will be Iran will freeze nuclear enrichment at 60%. Now, what does it mean? I'll talk about nuclear enrichment in just a bit. In just a couple of minutes, I will come to what is nuclear enrichment. How does it work? But just remember for now, nuclear enrichment maximum that Iran will do will be 60%, not more than that. Also, Iran says we will not attack American military in Syria or Iraq. We will allow the inspectors of IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, to come and have inspections. And Iran says we will not give ballistic missiles to Russia. This is what Iran has promised. In return, what has America promised? America has promised we will not impose any new sanctions on Iran. We will not seize their oil tankers. Also, America says that we would ensure that the money that Iran has, which has been frozen in South Korea and Iraq, it will be released immediately. So Iraq will have about more than $9 billion, close to $10 billion that will be released immediately. So it will be helpful for them. Iran's bank accounts will be released, will be defrozen in the coming months. If this deal upholds, this is the entire idea. But this will be an unwritten deal. The objective is they don't want it to now go to the parliament because see, American internal politics is also very interesting. So America has two main political parties, right? Democrats and Republicans. The problem here is Republicans have always been against Iran deal. Like Donald Trump is a Republican. When he became the president, he said that no deal with Iran. Democrats would want the deal. Now the interesting part is, although the Democrats do have a majority in the American Parliament, although the Democrats can have a majority, but the problem here is, Democrats, for example, in the Senate, they are 50-50, 50, 50, 50 Republicans, 50 Democrats. The problem here is, in the Senate or anywhere in the American Parliament, they do not have something like an anti-defection law. So even if two or three members of the Democrat party, Joe Biden's own party, vote against the deal, the deal will not go forward. So they can't take that risk. Republicans have always been against the deal. They can't take that risk. So they don't want to go to the US Congress or the US Parliament for their approval. America's P5 plus one plan called the JCPOA also <clears throat> was not really supported by the Republicans. And this is again why the deal this time around would be an informal and unwritten deal. Now, <clears throat> what are the other countries reacting? First, Israel. Now, Israel has always been against Iran. Israel and Iran have been enemies for a very, very long time. 
Israel thinks that Iran is one of those countries that are still that have still not accepted that Israel belongs to this region. Iran has been waging proxy wars against Israel and Israel has been doing the same. While Israel has improved its relationship with most of the Middle East countries, but with Iran, the relationship still is not normal. Israel has never been in favor of this deal. They did not want the earlier P5 plus 1 deal and they don't want this deal even today. Israel has said that even if the deal goes forward, we are not a party to the deal. So if we want to do something against Iran, we will do that. That is what Israel says. That we will still try and put sanctions on Iran. We don't have anything to do with the deal. Now, let's talk about what is the implication of what will be the impact that India will have. Let's say this deal goes ahead. Let's say the deal is final. Iran's assets are unfrozen. What will the deal or what will be the impact that India would see? First big impact. Iran's oil will enter the international market. More buying, more options to buy oil means the oil prices will reduce. For India, if you actually see very clearly, if you look at India's map, if you look at the world map, the nearest country to India that can sell oil to us is actually Iran. If you go back about a couple of decades, basically before Barack Obama became the American president, India used to buy maximum oil from Iran only. Because Iran is the closest oil supplier to us, so transportation cost was the lowest. Also, our refineries that we had made were mainly made for Iranian oil to refine them. But under American pressure, because America did not want us to buy oil, they wanted to impose sanctions. Under American pressure, we almost cut down our oil buying from Iran to zero. Now that can improve. India would be able to buy cheap Iranian oil because it is always good to have multiple options when you're buying anything. You can't always depend on Russia, for example, for cheaper oil because when, when and if the war, Russia-Ukraine war ends, obviously Russian oil prices will increase. So we can't really be dependent on them always. Secondly, India also has a lot of investment in Iran. The Chabar port, the Bandar Abbas port, we have shown a lot of keen interest in these ports. Chabar port has had a lot of Indian investment. Not just this, the INSTC International North-South Transit Corridor, which will give India connectivity to Russia, Central Asia also goes to Iran. So if we are able to improve our relationship with Iran, it would be in our best interest. We don't want Iran to become extremely close to China because that will go against us. This is why India would also want this kind of a deal to go ahead. Now coming to what is nuclear enrichment. As I said, nuclear enrichment is the entire basis of the problem between Iran and US. Let's understand this. Basically, if you look at natural uranium, how does it occur in nature? 99% of uranium that occurs is uranium-238. While on the other hand, only 0.7% of uranium occurring naturally is uranium-235. In order to have a nuclear weapon, in order to have nuclear energy, in order to use uranium in the nuclear plants, you require uranium-235 because you can then perform nuclear fission. The problem here is uranium-235 doesn't occur naturally, it only occurs 0.07%. In simple terms, the process of converting this 238 into 235, increasing the proportion of uranium 235 is called uranium enrichment. Uranium enrichment means when you are trying to increase this uranium 235 promo, uh, proportion in the uranium that you have. For developing a nuclear weapon, please remember this. In order to develop a nuclear weapon, you need to reach 90% enrichment. You need to reach 90% enrichment. That is why America wants to stop Iran as per the deal at 60% only. If they reach 90%, they would have enough enriched uranium to then go ahead and build their nuclear weapons. This is something that we do not want. More enriched the uranium, the more energy it would have. The more energy it has, it depends whether you want to use that energy to produce electricity or to produce weapons. 
this is where the entire deal lies this is an infographic that you can use to revise natural uranium only 0.7% of uranium 235 low enrichment means about 5% it can be used in some nuclear power plants 20 to percent or more it can be used for research reactors for undertaking other research studies for weapon grade you require 90 percent of uranium 235 that is how the deal actually works after america walked out of the deal iran has been enriching its uranium more but they have not reached 90 percent at least so far so it remains to be seen whether or not this verbal agreement if it comes to the picture if it is successful or not this was our second important article for the day. Okay, Ashu Singh, do you think US Iran deal could change geopolitical dynamics in the Indian Pacific region? If Iran is able to increase its oil export, lifting of tanks, see, yeah, any major deal would obviously change power dynamics. It doesn't really have to be only this deal. The entire reason is that China and Iran are very close now. China has invested a lot of money in Iran. They will be investing a lot more money. US coming back into the picture would obviously change the power dynamics. How only the time will tell, but yes, it will. MRQ, yes, MRQ, uh, your question is, Iran not providing ballistic missiles to Russia. Do they have their technology so developed? Yes, they have worked a lot of their technology. Iran is a very peculiar country. If you see the history of Iran, Iran has had a lot of very interesting developments. Iranian scientists have been renowned around the entire world to work on a lot of cutting edge technologies. So don't think that Iran doesn't have a lot of technology. Iran have had its own set of problems with US, but in the past, Iran has had a lot of very cutting edge technology. A lot of great scientists have come out from Iran. What is the problem of USA with Russia? <laughs> Not a question that I can answer in one minute. It's a, it will require one long class. It goes back to the time of the Second World War. In fact, before the Second World War, when the world was divided into two parts, it started with the question of ideology, communism versus capitalism. Now it's more of a problem of who wants to take the top post in the world. There can only be one real superpower. So it depends on which country wants to have that post of superpower, US or America. US or Russia. Uh, Chota, no. CRS is also inspecting over incident. <clears throat> Just at this time around, CBI will also conduct an inquiry. Um, so, Pandu, no G5. I said P5, not G5. The deal will happen or not, we'll get to know soon. But right now, we have not seen any deal that is happening. The, the deal is in talks. Okay, a couple of more questions. Kumkum is saying, why is that the US doesn't want any other country to develop nuclear weapons? So basically, these big countries like US, France, UK, they think that they are the <coughs> real uh, leaders of the world. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry. So these big countries such as the US, etc., they think that if a lot of countries develop nuclear weapons, it would go against a peaceful world, a democratic world. It's unfair, but they think that they should only have the nuclear weapons so that they can maintain peace in the world. They think the more countries that have weapons in their hands, the more problematic it will become. Okay, let's go ahead then from Pillay's point of view. First topic, the oceans are warming as all of you know because of global warming and it has become or it has made it harder for the IMD to forecast the cyclones in the Arabian Sea. Now, if you actually see, and you would have read this in geography as well, I'm very sure. If you look at India's history and the number of cyc cyclones that have hit India, more and more cyclones have hit India from the side of Bay of Bengal as compared to Arabian Sea. But we do have an increasing number of cyclones now building up in Arabian Sea as well. Why? Because if you actually see, one of the very key reasons behind how actually cyclone actually originates, one of the key reasons is the water temperature as the water is becoming warmer in the Arabian Sea we see more and more of these cyclones building up in the Arabian Sea as well the problem is it is actually making it very very tough for the IMD to predict 
and have a forecast about the trajectory of this cyclone. For example, the Bipper Joy cyclone also, the prediction of the path of the cyclone was different as compared to the path that is actually taken right now. This is also not because we don't have enough technology. It's just because the situation is changing so much on the ground that the IMD's prediction for Bipper Joy was not 100% accurate. And a part of that or the big, big reason for that is the global warming and the warming of the sea, mainly in the Arabian Sea. Now, as I said, historically also the Arabian Sea has seen lesser cyclones as compared to Bay of Bengal that have hit India. But with the Arabian Sea now becoming hotter and hotter, warmer and warmer, we have seen many more cyclones now originating in the Arabian Sea as well. Also, in the building up of the cyclones, a big role is played not just by the temperature of the water, role is also played by the winds in the upper reach of the atmosphere called the steering winds. They are the ones who decide the, the direction, how the cyclones will go ahead, what direction will it take. Also, Arabian Sea has a much deeper layer of warm water compared to the Bay of Bengal. That is also why it is hard for the IMD to predict what exact direction will be taken by the cyclones originating in the Arabian Sea. Arabian Sea has much deeper layers of warm water. All these small little facts are important for prelims examination point of view. They can be asked very easily about cyclones and their comparison in Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. Please do remember all of these. These are all extremely, extremely important. Now, cyclones is one of those natural disasters that have seen the worst in India. For example, cyclones constitute 30% of all the damages caused due to natural disasters in India. We have multiple coastal states, we have so many coastal districts, India has a very long coastline. Because of that long coastline, we have a lot of advantages. We have a large exclusive economic zone, we have large international trade also. But the disadvantages also come into play and that is these natural disasters and also a security concern. India is exposed to 10% of the world's tropical cyclones. Also, there is a UN report that has suggested cyclone frequency will double in India. ADB is Asian Development Bank. Asian Development Bank also says India will lose 2% of GDP due to natural disasters by 2050. That is why when you say that global warming is increasing, when you say the average temperature of the earth is increasing, it should not increase. These are the reasons why we say that. It has a harmful impact not just on our day-to-day -day lives, but also on these natural disasters and the trade that we have with the other countries. There are certain initiatives that we have taken from our side, not necessarily to stop the cyclones, but just to make sure that we are able to control the disaster. For example, the IMD has announced they will launch an impact-based cyclone warning system to warn the people as soon as possible. We also have something called Sagarwani. Sagarwani is a system that is used to give information to fishermen in the local languages that don't go out in the sea if there is a cyclone that is expected. Government has also launched something called Gemini. It's a portable receiver for fail-proof warning to fishermen again about not going out in the sea if they have this kind of a warning. Now, I'll tell you something very interesting. I'll tell you something very interesting. Uh, India is not the only country that faces these cyclones kind of a problem. What happened was, if you look at our neighboring country, Bangladesh. Bangladesh also has same kind of a problem. Most of the cyclones that originate in Bay of Bengal, when they impact India, they impact Bangladesh as well. Now, I'll tell you something very interesting. Do you know, about three decades back, whenever there's cyclones, etc., used to hit Bangladesh, there used to be a widespread devastation. Thousands of people used to be killed. A very interesting study was done. Please understand this. A very interesting study was done. The study was in Bangladesh, whenever a lot of people lost their lives, it was seen most of the people losing the lives were actually women and not men. It was a very interesting study that came out that why is it that a lot of women are losing their lives in Bangladesh and not men. Why is it that the cyclones or these kind of things actually only impact women? And there was a study. I'll tell you what happened. So basically what happened was people who are living by near these coastal areas, they were not very rich people. 
they were not rich meaning that most of them had only one mobile phone in their house if at all only one mobile phone per house or many houses did not have mobile phone so that mobile phone was with the male in the family so what happened was when the males in the family would used to go out to work to earn their wages even if the government sent the message on their mobile phone that a cyclone is approaching that you should leave your place there was no way for the message to reach the women in the household because the only mobile phone that they had was with the men they were going outside and they did not have any mobile phone in their houses for the women to actually warn them and this entire study was conducted and this is the reason why women were much more susceptible to these natural disasters what after government of bangladesh realized this the government of bangladesh started an initiative where they ensured that women living nearby the coastal areas also have these mobile phones and it was seen that after that the number of casualty of cyclones reduced drastically so see gender imparity gender imbalance has such a big impact that we don't even understand we think gender inequality is what women not getting job women not getting education no gender inequality can even result in more women losing their lives as well so this happens in a lot of developing countries and there have been many studies that have been conducted in this regard because with cyclones and these kind of things you can't really stop them the only thing that you can do is warn people as soon as possible so that they take evasive action as quickly as possible the next news that we have is nehru memorial museum and library the famous new delhi landmark is now being renamed it will now be renamed as prime minister's museum and library society we will not go into the politics of this we will not go into what congress is saying we will not go into what the bjp is saying that is not really important for us that will not be ours in the paper we will be focusing on the concept of or the significance of nehru memorial museum and library society what is it how does it work so this is a very famous landmark in delhi especially for those who are researching something you will see a lot of people who are writing their books who are pursuing phd etc in any topic of history who are writing political books a lot of people go there because it has a lot of research papers a lot of books letters which you will not find anywhere in the world are stored in that library it is an autonomous institution it works under ministry of culture now it's a government establishment it was set up in 1964 because that was a year when nehru died so it was in the memory of jawahar lal nehru he did not establish it it was established after his death in 1964 it's located in teen murti house the teen murti house is the place which was the official res residence of the first prime minister of the country it has multiple different parts for example it has a museum it has a library it has center for contemporary studies and nehru planetarium as well this library again is extremely extremely rich you will see a lot of researchers sitting there a lot of authors sitting there taking out data so that they can inculcate that into their book it is the world's leading source of india's first prime minister and lot of freedom fighters lot of exclusive writings of mahatma gandhi sri rajgopalachari charan singh jay prakash narayan sauni naidu all of these can be found there the government in 2010 also started a process to digitize this because when you make it digital it will have a much longer life so it, they are trying to make it digital they are trying to click photographs to have all this information in the digital form as well as i said it is the one single place where all the political researchers the authors etc go it is available for all yes you can see so what happens is there is a membership also when you take membership you will be you will get access to a lot more data a lot more important books but it is free you can walk in you can just go as a normal person refer to books etc that is also fine the last news story for the day is we have a new song released yesterday i listened to this this morning in fact when i was preparing this ppt i did listen to this song as well you go on youtube and you will type this so there is a new song released yesterday which is called abundance in millets why is this song famous this song famous because it is partly written by our prime minister he has collaborated with a famous musician miss falguni shah who is a grammy award winning indian american singer this is a song that talks about the importance of millets 
and in between that song there's also a bit of speech of the prime minister so you go and just re i'm not saying it's a part of the syllabus to listen to the song but what is a part of the syllabus is about millets because millets is important the song name is abundance in millets the reason why it is in the news is 2023 as you know is the international year of millets because india had proposed it to un that is why millets becomes extremely important this year around the singer with which prime minister has collaborated remember her name falguni shah she is a grammy award winner she won the grammy last year for her best children's album that album was called a colorful world if the upsc can ask questions from sports i am sure music is not very far away so please don't take it for granted doesn't really have to be a lot of detail study just remember the name that would be good enough as you know millets have always been a part of our food chain for a long long time in fact there are solid evidences they were the first crops to be grown and they were consumed in the indus valley civilization as well we have discussed about millets earlier as well multiple times just to reiterate quickly millets is not just one crop millets is a generic term used for multiple crops which are small seeded and they are cultivated as grain crops some of the common millets in india include ragi jowar sama bajra variga etc india is the largest producer of millets in the entire world we have many african countries also producing millets now nigeria is number 2 china also has a significant millets production all these are some of the facts about millets that you must know about also government has launched multiple initiatives to give a boost to millets for example national millets mission came up in 2007 to promote production and consumption also government has also supported the price of the millets to ensure it is financially viable for the farmers to cultivate millets we also have value added products for example the government is giving encouragement for people to consume millet because see as you understand in india your first choice is not to go to millets we eat a lot of rice we eat a lot of wheat etc but millets is not something that we are really used to in our taste buds you might not like the taste of the millets at the first go but the reason why millets are important they can be grown without a lot of water they are drain resistant in uh, drought resistant in most of the cases they are extremely nutritious as well that is why government is trying to promote them in the pds as well to distribute under various government schemes government is also trying to promote the organic farming culture in millet so that more and more people can go ahead and buy this as well this brings us to the end of today's session some interesting news stories please do make sure that you try and remember all of these these are couple of practice questions for all of you first about the us iran nuclear deal and second one about the millets this brings us to the end of the session do join us tomorrow as well 10 am for the next hindu analysis session do try and write answers to these questions use your answer writing portal to give each other feedback and learn from each other's mistakes as well i'll see you tomorrow at 10 am thank you so much bye bye have a good day jai hind